Number one. This is an encounter my mother had shortly after I was born. It takes place in the mid-1980s in central London. It's early summer, and being London, this means hot and muggy. Some background. I am my mother's firstborn, though not her first pregnancy. The women in my family have health issues, which means we're prone to miscarriages, and pregnancy is basically hell. Right before falling pregnant with me, my mother had experienced her first miscarriage, and, well, she wasn't in her best state of mind. She was incredibly depressed, and fearful that something would go wrong with me. This was not helped by the fact that she didn't even have a bump until she was about eight months pregnant, and, rather than gaining weight, she actually lost it due to extreme morning sickness, and had dropped from a UK size 8 to 10 to a UK size 4 to 6. Additionally, during my birth, she had required resuscitation after almost dying from complications, and I was also born with some health issues. So, all in all, she wasn't a healthy pup, and neither was I for that matter, but at least I slept a lot, so she could rest at least. Anyway, at this point, I'm about six weeks old. My mother is still really ill and run down, but she needs to sort out a passport for me so that she can show me off to her family in Spain before we moved abroad to Israel. My dad is Israeli, and he had been offered a job back home. However, at the time, and being the age I was, the only option was to put me on either my dad's or my mother's passport until I was older. Since my dad was working all the time, this meant going to the Spanish embassy, as my mother is Spanish, and getting my name added to her passport. So, hot and muggy day in London. The Spanish embassy is incredibly slow at doing anything, and spends ages messing my mother around before finally telling her that she needs to come back the following week to complete the passport process. My mother isn't happy at all, as she's ill and fed up. Plus, she has me in a papoose across her chest, which only adds to the heat. She goes down the steps to the tube platform so she can catch the tube home. But there are delays, so she has to wait. Around her are a mix of people, but mostly men in business suits. She doesn't notice the tall, heavily built guy staring at her, until he's by her side. He starts trying to get it on with her, telling her how he could show her a good time, and if she was up for it. My mother, my mother glares, points to me in the papoose, and sternly tells him that she is a married mother, and in no way is she interested in him or anyone else for a good time. The guy starts getting more aggressive with his approach, keeps telling her how he's going to give her a good time and she'll never forget it, and starts trying to touch her. My mother pushes him away and tells him to back off. At this point, the other commuters are starting to notice that something is up, but nobody does anything. The guy then makes a grab for my mother and tries to pick her up and pull her towards the tube steps. He makes a go to reach for me and the papoose so as to throw me off, and my mother at this point flips. Now, the way my mother describes it, she says it was like a red haze. All she knew was that I was in danger, and she was too ill and fed up to be pushed around by some rapey arsehole. She yanked herself away from his grip, and proceeded to start punching, scratching and kicking the guy with all her strength. She didn't care that she was barely chest height to him, she just wanted him away from her. The guy was screaming at her that she was crazy and that he would kill her, but she just kept attacking him. The other commuters, after watching in shock for a few seconds, suddenly realize that they need to do something and step in to help my mother. The police are called, and the guy, now flat out on the ground, is arrested. My mother is shaking. She's still angry, and wants to keep beating on the guy, but some of the commuters are holding her back, trying to calm her down. One of the commuters comes up to her, and tells her that was one of the bravest and most stupid things he's ever seen a woman do. 
She asks why, and he points out to the guy as he's being taken away. He had a knife, and he had been trying to use it to stab her and me whilst she was attacking him. At this point, the reality of the situation sunk in. This guy had wanted to essentially rape and kill her, and when she attacked, she had come incredibly close to having both herself and me killed. She burst into tears, and was assisted home by some of the other commuters. Number two. My partner's parents, Angus and Fiona, live in Scotland. On weekends, they stay at their spacious house in the Scottish Highlands, but during the work week, they stay at their tiny, utilitarian row house in Aberdeen. The house itself is a renovated former fishing cottage in a long row of similar cottages that sit right on the North Sea. The neighbourhood itself is picturesque with cobblestone streets, and my parents-in-law have occasionally been going about their business in their tiny kitchen living room and had to shoo out a clueless foreign tourist who barged in, thinking their house must be some kind of museum or attraction. My partner's parents used to be pretty lax about locking their doors at night. That is, until the incident I'm about to relate. They were sound asleep in the small bedroom of the Aberdeen house, when my father-in-law suddenly came awake with the sick feeling that something was wrong. It was dark, and his eyes were still blurry from sleep, but as he scanned the room, he detected a slight movement at the foot of the bed. By this time, my mother-in-law had woken up too, and she gasped and grabbed her husband's arm. His eyes had adjusted to the dark now, and made out the unmistakable figure of a man in dark clothing, standing between the bed and the doorway. Angus is a former military man, and he's seen his fair share of mayhem. He jumped out of bed, fists balled and ready to go, and yelling, What the hell are you doing in our house? The intruder just stood there, looking at him, as if he was trying to make up his mind about something. After a moment or two of silence, the man said quietly, Sorry, wrong house, and simply turned and walked out. Angus followed him to make sure he left, and dead bolted the door behind him. Oh my god, call the police, Fiona said, turning on her bedside light. But when they picked up the phone, it was dead. Angus went to check, his heart in his throat in case the intruder was still lurking nearby. Their phone lines had been cut. If my father-in-law hadn't woken up and interrupted their intruder, I can only imagine what might have happened. Needless to say, now they always lock their door. Number three. So, about 20 minutes ago, my mother came into my room to discuss my little sister's birthday party. She's turning 11 in two days. She noticed that I was reading the Let's Not Meet subreddit. After informing her about the content of the site, she decided to tell me a story of her own. To start off, it would be wise to note that my mother was born and raised in a place in Russia near the Caucasus Mountains called Chechnya. This town was pretty crime-ridden and old-fashioned, and known for its eye-for-an-eye -eye policy, meaning that if you killed someone, you should expect your family members and or yourself to be killed as repayment. Another pretty important piece of information you should know is that the Russian side of my family was very involved in the mob. My great uncle was one of the leaders of a powerful mob back in the late 60s. I'll have to re-ask my mum for his last name, but he was pretty well known. I'm pretty sure it started with a K, 
so for convenience sake, I will refer to him as K for the rest of this story. My mum was about 20 years old when she decided that she had spent her break from medical school near the Black Sea, where she'd meet up with some of her friends. She decided to come a day early to have fun on the beach before meeting up with her friends. However, as she was sunbathing, she fell asleep and woke up with awful heat stroke to the point where she was going to faint. She made it to the road and hailed for a cab for several minutes until a vehicle that looked like one of those expensive private cars rolled up. I don't know if they're widely known, but they're basically taxis that look like regular cars. Anyway, despite there already being a man in the car, my mum decided to try her luck, because it was either this or she would pass out on the street. They let her in, and it seemed like everything was going fine, until she realised they drove past her hotel. Eventually, they got off the road and started driving into the woods. That's when my mum realised they probably weren't cab drivers, she had no weapons she could use. She was five feet tall and incredibly thin. All she was wearing was her bathing suit and a pullover dress, and she was still ill from heat stroke. Because of all of that, she decided to use her words instead. I don't know if you know who I am, but I'm Kay's niece, and my family's from Chechnya. You know that if you do anything to me, my family especially my uncle, will find you and kill you and your parents and any relatives you may have. She just went on and on about her family and Chechnya's customs until the driver of the car stopped and confirmed her statements, mentioning he knew some men in the army who knew of her uncle and abided by the Chechen culture of an eye for an eye. After coming to a silent but mutual agreement, they drove her back to the hotel in complete silence, and she never saw them again. Number 4 My memories of this incident fade in and out, so I may skip some descriptions a little at points. Actually, the older I'm getting, the more it's coming back to me. I grew up in Germany, and it must have been 1992 or 93. Once a year, my class would go on a school trip. It was during my second or third year, so I must have been about eight or nine years old. Enrollment is from age six in Germany, but I enrolled at age seven, before anyone tries to question my age at this point. Our next trip was somewhere in Lower Saxony, I can't remember where exactly. Each room had four bunk beds by the door and a recreational area at the end of the room. It had large windows and a glass door to open it. Well, as kids do, we joked around and stayed up longer than we were permitted to. It was actually so dark outside that it kind of scared us, so we kept the curtains closed. A classmate of mine played a daring game hiding behind the curtains and tearing them open. A friend of mine, Dennis, decided to run outside and frighten the others next door, which he did. The next thing I remember, Dennis was back in our room, and we saw something moving outside. We started to panic, and we told our teacher. She told us to calm down, closed the curtains and left. Dennis was curious, and found it extremely funny to run outside again. The next thing I remember is me standing outside, because I was worried about Dennis. Then, I remember some guy picking him up and vanishing in the dark. I couldn't see a thing. I called his name, and a few moments later, he appeared before me, laughing. He told me to try out this fun game of being carried away by this guy. My next memory is of Dennis panicking, and I was in the arms of this man. He ran away with me, and the hostel's light seemed more and more distant. 
I struggled with him to let me go, because he was pressing my chest so tightly. He told me that it was fun and I shouldn't worry. I continued to fight and yelled for help. He then began to panic, and started strangling me. I lost my breath. For some reason, I was able to grab his hand and pull it away from my neck. Why are you so strong? I will never forget those words. The next memory I have, I'm free, kicking him in the leg and running back. I returned, and other things happened. My math teacher caught the guy, and another teacher talked to me about something. I know that they told the guy to leave. The next morning, the police arrived with this boy. He was in his teens or early twenties. They made him apologize because he caused so much trouble in the area the night before. I still remember his eyes widen when he saw me. For some reason, my teacher called me a liar and that I shouldn't tell my parents. That's all I really remember. I always believed it was a figment of my imagination. The funny thing is though, I can't have anything tight around my neck nowadays. For example, ties. They stress me out. Whenever I have an anxiety attack, my chest and throat tighten only. I guess it's some form of confirmation to me that those memories are true. Number five. Please note, this next story is from a female's perspective. Between August 2012 and June 2013, when I was 20 years old, my boyfriend, Ryan, was living abroad in Trieste, Italy, as a teacher. We're both from New England, and I, unfortunately, was stuck at home for my junior year of college. Ten months is a long time to be in a long-distance relationship. So, for Christmas, my parents told me that I could go and visit Ryan during his February holiday, which happened to fall on his birthday and Valentine's Day. In short, it was perfect. When the time came, I sat at the airport and said a quick goodbye and happy birthday to Ryan via text message, as I knew I wouldn't get service on the flight or at all in Europe. He wasn't able to meet me at the airport because of work, so he texted me directions about what to do when I landed in Trieste. The directions went something like this. When you land, go out to the buses. Get on the C bus and take it for about 45 minutes. At the end, you will be at a train station, and I'll meet you there. It wouldn't hurt to get a map or to ask someone for directions if they speak English, but if you follow my directions, you should have no problem. This all seemed pretty straightforward to me, but as I was sitting on the bus, I couldn't help but feel like I'd done something wrong. You know how it is, when you're helpless you always assume the worst, and I was pretty helpless, in a foreign country with little knowledge of the language and no travelling companion. So naturally, I was worried. I decided to try and communicate with the woman next to me, just to calm my nerves. Scusi, uh, ingles? Parle ingles? She made a face, and held up her fingers to show that she spoke a little English. Oh, uh, grazie. I'm looking for the train station. Um, Stesiano Treno? Dove? I pulled out the map that I got at the airport, and I pointed to the train station on the map. She smiled immediately. Si, si vengo con me. Which I'm pretty sure means come with me, and even if it doesn't, she seemed to know where I wanted to go, and after viewing the map, how could she not? After 15 or 20 minutes into the bus ride, the bus stops in a really sketchy looking part of the city. The woman stood up and made a come here gesture with her hands, I looked around at the buildings outside, and I didn't see a train station anywhere. Ryan had been adamant that I wouldn't miss it. 
Plus, I'd only been on the train for half of the time that he said I should have been. Alarm bells started to go off in my head. This woman was being so insistent, yet she knew exactly where I wanted to go because I'd shown her on the map. And this clearly wasn't it. Then, she grabbed my arm and tried to pull me out of my seat. I was not having any of this. I said, no, no grazie, ciao, ciao and waved goodbye. She looked really irritated, but she seemed to give up. I heard her mutter something which I couldn't understand in Italian, and that's when five dudes stood up from all different parts of the bus and got off with her. The six of them were clearly together, yet she had sat next to me and had not once talked to any of them over the course of the 20-minute bus ride. I was more than a little creeped out, but I made it to my stop without any further incident, about half an hour later. I mentioned my experience to Ryan, and the two of us laughed it off, joking that I could have ended up like the girl in Taken. I'm pretty sure I was overreacting, but sometimes I really wonder. Italy, Trieste in particular, is known for human trafficking. A huge ring was busted in May of last year. I feel like lonely, young foreign travellers are probably pretty easy targets for them. Using a woman to lure a young girl in, and then using men to strong-arm her, just doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility. Bad people or not, it was a pretty scary experience for me, and I'm glad I stayed on the bus. Who knows where I'd be right now. Hi guys, Lazy here. Thank you so much for listening to these stories, and I really hope you enjoyed them. Uh, as a European myself, I found this a very interesting video to make. I know a lot of British people these days don't really consider themselves as Europeans, but they're just being difficult. <laughs> um, as always, make sure to check out the artwork of Anthony. Um, you can do that by following the links in the description below. And uh, make sure to let me know what types of stories you'd like to hear in some future videos as well. I do listen to all of your um, opinions and suggestions and all that, and a few of them are in the woodworks as we speak and going to be made into videos very shortly. Um, I'm also going to be trying to get a subscriber stories video out either tomorrow or on Sunday as well, so make sure to look out for that. Um, subscribe, like, share, and all that jazz, and you'll hear from me again very, very soon. Stay spooky, and remember, the best things happen in the dark.